Welcome, everybody. Welcome to today's episode of the Law of Self-Defense show. I am, of course, Attorney Andrew Branca for the Law of Self-Defense. Come on in, make yourselves comfortable. We ought to have a fairly, fairly concise show today. Let's make sure everything is streaming the way it should be. And with luck, that should be the case. Uh, kind of a state specific show today a couple of days ago one of our newest members sir brass uh, mentioned to me a provision of indiana self-defense immunity law that i thought was uh, well that was new to me i hadn't heard it before it seemed unusual i was uh having not seen the law myself i was skeptical so i asked him to send me the law and he did and by the way folks i love that so I never have any problem uh, being proven mistaken or not being aware of some facet of use of force law. If that ever happens, all I ask is you show me the actual law. Show me the statute. Show me the court decision. Show me the jury instruction. Bam. You've just expanded my knowledge base even further. I love to learn. Uh, and this was a new type of self-defense immunity provision to my knowledge, I hadn't seen this particular flavor before. And uh, when I looked at the... Uh, now, in fairness, I've just looked at the statutory language. I haven't looked at the case law around the statute. Uh, maybe maybe I'll do that quickly during the show uh, just to make sure there's nothing weird going on. But in the meantime, we're going to step through it. And this is Indiana-specific. Also, when I looked at this uh, Indiana immunity provision... Uh, of course, it led me to review the Indiana's core self-defense statute, which has some interesting provisions. I think it's worth going over. It's interesting framework. Legislators don't always do a great job uh, in drafting statutes, including self-defense statutes. So I thought it would be useful to step through that as well. Uh, let me see. Yeah, there's like there's like no case law on this Indiana immunity statute, in part because it's pretty new. It only took effect April 26, 2019, which is not a lot of time for case law to develop. So keep in mind, a statute becomes effective, and then it only applies to cases that occur after the date of the statute. Uh, and then it has to go to trial, and then after a trial, someone has to get convicted, and then after conviction, they have to decide to appeal. The appellate courts have to agree to take the appeal, um, so it can take years from the initial passage of a statute until we actually begin to see case law develop around that statute. And the reason that's important, of course, is that statutes by themselves have no effect in the real world. They're just words on paper. They don't have effect in the real world until they are interpreted and applied by courts to real people. And of course, the ultimate interpretation and application by the courts is the appellate courts, their interpretation definition, application of statutory language creates law, case law. It's referred to just as valid law as the statutory law itself. So if you've only read statutory language and not the cases that interpret and apply those statutes, you may not know what the statute actually means because it doesn't mean what it might appear to mean based on a plain English reading. It doesn't mean what the legislature might have hoped it would mean. It means ultimately what the courts say it means. That's where the rubber meets the road. Uh, but I'm looking at this uh, immunity statute in Lexis and there's there's no there's no case law annotations at all. So we'll just work with the statute today. All right, so I think everything is streaming the way it's supposed to be streaming. And it is. So let's go ahead and start the formal launch of today's show. Here we go. All right, so we are back to talk about Indiana self-defense immunity law because it has an odd provision I've not seen in immunity laws generally. Uh, and uh, having not seen it, I, I, you know, people say things on the internet about the law all the time. And uh, unfortunately, much of it is uh, misunderstood or fabrications or internet myth. Uh, so when I come across an area of the law that I know pretty well, and I know self-defense immunity law pretty well, and I'm not familiar with it, I always ask, 
well, show me the law, show me the statute, show me the court decision, show me the jury instruction. And law self-defense member Sir Brass just became a member this week who brought this immunity provision to my attention within moments, had sent me the statute, which I reviewed yesterday, and that becomes the subject of today's show today. Uh, I'll, I should also mention that um, I have a standing law of self-defense blog post about immunity laws. Uh, in fact, let me pull that up so we can see it quickly. For any law of self-defense members, you need to be a member. That's one of the benefits of membership is we have these kind of standing blog posts. You can go to uh, lawofselfdefense.com slash immunity, and it'll pull up this blog post here. Talks about self-defense immunity. And then at the bottom, it has various immunity provisions from different states. Um, now, of course, this changes from time to time. We do update it from time to time. We don't necessarily update it instantly. We update it as we become aware of new immunity provisions. For example, I just added this Indiana immunity provision today because I just became aware of it this week. Uh, but it's a good starting point. So I wouldn't call this authoritative because again, it's not like it's instantly updated every time something changes, but it's a good starting point for people interested in reading immunity laws, how they're typically structured in statute and so forth. That's at lawofselfdefense.com slash immunity. All part of being a Law of Self-Defense member. And if you're not a Law of Self-Defense member, I have to ask you, why not? It's dirt cheap. Try it out for two weeks for just 99 cents. If you stay a member after the two-week trial, it's only about 30 cents a day, less than $10 a month to be a Law of Self-Defense member. If you look in the chat, you'll see most of the Law of Self-Defense members say it's the best $10 they spend every month. A couple cups of coffee at Starbucks, you've covered your membership. I encourage you to start with the two-week trial. It's only 99 cents for the two weeks. Lawofselfdefense.com slash trial. I should also mention that on Monday, we start the fall semester of American Law Courses. American Law Courses are our law school level courses, typically 1L or first year law school level courses taught in plain English without the woke and diversity ideology of today's law schools. Be the best citizen you can be. We have courses in criminal law, evidence, property, and starting on Monday, we have business law being taught by none other than our good friend and colleague, Andrew Esquire. Uh, we have the pre-registration price still available on this course. Uh, of course, you can also sign up for a bundle of the courses I just mentioned, and then becomes increasingly less expensive on a per cost, per course basis. But these are a semester-long course in business law, taught live every week by Andrew Esquire, even in courses. Plenty of opportunity to interact live with Professor Esquire on this business law course, as we do with all our courses. And if you're wondering why business law should matter to you, well, in America, the best way for any individual to create true wealth for themselves over time is to be a business owner, whether it's your it's a side gig and most small businesses don't have the resiliency and capital to be able to afford to make lots of mistakes early on. So don't make those mistakes, make better informed, more confident business decisions in your pursuit of being the best economic creator of value that you can be with this American law courses, business law course, learn more at AmericanLawCourses.com. What else? Do I have to talk about, uh, let's see. Oh, yes, Nick, Nick Riqueda is having another meetup. He does these periodically several times a year. He did one in Vegas a few months ago. I was at, it was a huge blast. Had a great time. He's doing one in Nashville, uh, not this Saturday, but the following Saturday, September 16th. And I will be there. I will be there for this Nashville get together. Uh, we'll have a stage. We'll tell some jokes, have some drinks. Uh, and then we'll mingle in the audience uh, as well. It's about five hours of get together. So if you'd like to meet me, like to meet Nick, like to meet the other people who kind of orbit in Nick's somewhat crazy world, uh, Saturday, September 16th in Nashville would be the place to do that. Now, Nick has to pay for the venue. So he is selling tickets to cover the cost of the venue. Uh, you can learn more about all that. Get your tickets at lawofselfdefense.com slash Nick. That's We'll just redirect you to this uh, event bright page so you can do do your ticket. 
ticket purchase there. And I look forward. I've been getting lots of emails and texts and messages from people who are letting me know they're going to be there. I'm really looking forward uh, to meeting all of you who will be there in person. It's going to be a fun time. All right. So let's talk about Indiana self-defense law. Boom, 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 boom. Let me bump that up so it's easier to read. Uh, and first, we're going to start with Indiana's self-defense statute. And then we'll take a look at their self-defense immunity provision. Because, of course, the immunity provision, like most immunity provisions, says, you know, if your conduct fits our definition of self-defense, whatever the statutory definition of self-defense is in the state, then you can apply for immunity from either prosecution or civil suit. It depends. Some states give you both criminal immunity and civil immunity. Some only give you one. That varies. But you only get the immunity if your conduct was actually lawful self-defense, if it meets the elements of self-defense of your particular state. Um, self-defense immunity is not a get-out-of-jail-free card. If your use of force was not lawful self-defense, you don't get the immunity. You have to qualify for self-defense first, and then the immunity follows. So that being the normal sequence of events, I think it's worth taking a look at the actual elements of self-defense under Indiana law. Now, of course, we'll see the five elements as we describe them here. Innocence, imminence, proportionality, avoidance, and reasonableness. We'll spot those uh, as we read through the Indiana self-defense law as once you're informed and you're aware of what the core elements of any self-defense claim anywhere in the country are, when you read your state self-defense law, you'll invariably find those elements there. I assure you they are present. Uh, self-defense law is very old law, thousands of years old, incorporated into American law from old English common law. It's about 80% the same across the 50 states, even though every state has its own self-defense statutes and case law and jury instructions, the underlying principles, the five elements, are largely the same. Now, the 20% difference matters. It can mean the difference between you know, an acquittal at trial or no charges at all and a conviction that puts you in a cage for the rest of your life. So it, the 20% matters. But it's useful that the principles are largely the same from state to state because it allows us to have these kinds of conversations on a nationwide basis. Uh, so the self-defense statute in Indiana, 354132 is their coding system there. 35 being title, 35, criminal law and procedure, article 41, crimes, chapter three, defenses, two, culpability. So self-defense, of course, is a physical act. That's how many of us think of it, right? So we're attacked, we defend ourselves, an act of self-defense, but it's also a legal defense. It's a legal defense that you raise to a use of force criminal charge or civil claim. Um, and it's called a, it's a perfect defense, self-defense. So if you're successful in your defense, you have zero criminal liability. It doesn't just mitigate your liability, uh, criminal and civil. It eliminates it. What you did was simply not a crime. It simply was not a violation of a legal duty for which you would be civilly liable. But it's very binary the legal defense of self-defense. Either you qualify or you don't. It's like a light switch that's on or off. Uh, either you have zero legal liability because your claim of self-defense was deemed valid or your claim of self-defense was defective. You're missing one of the required elements of a claim of self-defense and you have 100% criminal liability, 100% civil liability for whatever damages you caused, wrongful death, whatever the case may be, and 100% criminal liability, which could mean life in a cage without possibility of early release. So the first chapter of this statute is really a statement by the legislature. We want it understood that this is how we feel about self-defense for the residents of Indiana. Um, it's not the kind of thing that would normally be communicated to jurors in a jury instruction, although I have seen states that say this uh, statement of intent by the legislature should be read to the jury. This should be part of the jury instruction, but unless the statute explicitly says that, it wouldn't typically be part of a jury instruction, um, And in which case it's just kind of feel-good language for the legislature's own benefit. 
Uh, but it reads, uh, in enacting this section, the General Assembly, the legislature of Indiana, finds and declares that it is the policy of this state to recognize the unique character of a citizen's home and to ensure that a citizen feels secure in his or her own home against unlawful intrusion by another individual or a public servant. So this is interesting already because, uh, for one thing, it tells us that at least part of the statute is going to be about what? Defense of highly defensible property against unlawful intrusion into the highly defensible property. So that's not the only thing the statute covered. It also covers straight up self-defense as if you were walking down the street. Um, but it's going to, at some point, specifically re refer to use of force in defense of highly defensible property, your home, against a unlawful intrusion by either some other individual or a public servant. So one of the notable things about the Indiana self-defense law is it spends quite a bit of time talking about, uh, one, the fact that there are circumstances in which you can use force against a public servant, like a police officer, and have that be lawful, and specifying what those circumstances are. Now, it's almost always the case that you can use force against a public servant, against a police officer, under the appropriate circumstances. If that officer is attempting to use unlawful force on you, for example, you'd be privileged to use force in self-defense against that unlawful force, just like you have a privilege to use force against any unlawful force that you're being threatened with or that's being used against you. Now, the trick with law enforcement, of course, is they have a lot of privilege to use lawful force, to be the initial aggressors in the course of their duties and making an arrest. Normally, other people don't have any privilege to use force against you as the initial aggressor, as the initiator, right? Um, but police officers do, depending on whether it's being done within the lawful boundaries of their legal duties. Uh, if an officer is using excessive force, unlawful force upon you, then you have a privilege to defend yourself against that unlawful force. That, that's really true in every state, but most states don't make it as explicit in their statutory code as does Indiana here. Uh, continuing, by reaffirming the long-standing right of a citizen to protect his or her home against unlawful intrusion, however, the General Assembly does not intend to diminish in any way the other robust self-defense rights that citizens of this state have always enjoyed. So it's not just about the home. There's other self-defense rights as well. Accordingly, the General Assembly also finds and declares that it is the policy of this state that people have a right to defend themselves and third parties, others, from physical harm and crime. The purpose of this section, the statute, is to provide the citizens of the state with a lawful means of carrying out this policy. Provisions concerning civil immunity for the justified use of force as defined in the self-defense statute are codified in statute 3430-31. I think it's 31-1. That's the self-defense immunity statute we're also going to look at today. So that's the introductory paragraph uh, A. Uh, paragraph B, as used in this section, public servant means, and I'm not going to click over to there, but there's obviously statutory definitions of what would qualify as a public servant for purposes of this self-defense statute. Uh, and here we have the straight up self-defense law. Now, it's this is not defensive home language here in paragraph C. This is just you're in public on the street, public space. Uh, you're attacked, you defend yourself. These are the elements of that not specific to highly defensible property, self-defense privilege. A person is justified in using reasonable force against any other person to protect themselves or a third person from what they reasonably believe to be the eminent use of unlawful force. Okay, straight up, we see a number of elements there. First of all, I'll point out reasonableness, very common. And of course, reasonableness is one of the elements of self-defense. Very common to see reasonableness referred to multiple times throughout a self-defense statute, often multiple times in a single sentence. So I just read the first sentence from paragraph C, the straight up self-defense law of Indiana, and it refers to reasonable twice in one sentence. And we'll see further references to reasonable. That reflects the weight and importance that self-defense law places on that fifth element of reasonableness. And of course, reasonableness 
is both subjective and objective. So you, it has two facets. You need to have both of them for the element of reasonableness to be satisfied. One is a subjective reasonableness. You have to have had a genuine, good faith, subjective belief in the need to use force and self-defense in your perceptions of the threat and so forth. But that subjective belief by itself is not enough. No matter how genuine, no matter how good faith, it's not sufficient if it's irrational or speculative or imaginative. Because the other half of reasonableness is objective reasonableness. That subjective belief has to be objectively reasonable, meaning a hypothetical, reasonable, and prudent person would have shared that belief. It's based on the application of powers of reason to actual evidence. Evidence from which you can make a reasonable inference that you were facing a threat. So you use uh, deadly force upon somebody because they're threatening you verbally, which by itself is not enough, but then they reach for their waistband as if reaching for a weapon. Well, you may not see a weapon. You don't necessarily have to wait to see a weapon. You're making a reasonable inference that the combination of the verbal threat of deadly force and their conduct consistent with someone accessing a weapon to carry through that threat, that would provide a reasoned basis for believing you're facing a deadly force threat. As opposed to well, for all I know, he could have had a gun or for all I know, he could have had a knife or there's a verbal threat alone and there's no physical conduct consistent with an apparent intent to carry out that verbal threat. Verbal threats alone, if that's all there is, not sufficient to justify deadly force in self-defense. So that's reasonableness. So let's continue. However, and now they add conditions. So this first sentence is properly understood as referring to only well, as a condition for either non-deadly defensive force and deadly defensive force. So before you're privileged to use force against another person uh, to protect yourself or a third person, you have to reasonably believe that you're facing eminent use of unlawful force by that person you're using your own defensive force against. But that's enough to justify non-deadly force and self-defense. But if you want to use deadly force and self-defense, there are additional conditions. However, a person is justified in using deadly force and does not have a duty to retreat if the person reasonably believes, reasonableness again, that force is necessary to prevent serious bodily injury to yourself or the third person or the commission of a forcible felony. And a forcible felony is typically a felony that involves a threat of harm to persons, like a robbery, an armed robbery, for example. So what are the elements we have here? Well, it's justified in using deadly force. Now that we're referring to deadly force, we're talking about the element of proportionality, the distinction between whether we're in the non-deadly force bucket or the deadly force bucket. If you're only being threatened with non-deadly force, you can only use non-deadly force in self-defense. You can't use deadly defensive force until you're facing a deadly force threat. So you're justified in using deadly force to prevent serious bodily injury. That's proportionality. And serious bodily injury is typically, that's part of the deadly force bucket. So deadly force includes force, not just force that can kill you, but force that can kill you or cause serious bodily injury. Some states call this grave bodily harm, grave physical harm, serious physical harm. They all have a three-word phrase for this concept of something more than a modest injury. And typically, it's a maiming injury, blinding, loss of a bodily function, permanent scarring, loss of consciousness, rape, kidnapping um, would be included here. Uh, even if there's no death, it's still deadly force. It's in the deadly force bucket because it's serious bodily injury. So you're justified in using deadly force only if you're facing a deadly force threat, meaning death or serious bodily injury. Of course, death itself is serious bodily injury. Or a forcible felony. Again, a felony that implicitly has a threat of violence against a person. Because there are lots of felonies that don't, right? So someone writes a bad check over a certain dollar amount, it's a felony, but it's not a forcible felony. Uh, and they refer to does not have a duty to retreat in the context of deadly defensive force. That's addressing the element of avoidance. So now we have reasonableness. We have uh, deadly force, so proportionality. We have no duty to retreat, so we have avoidance. And we also have reference to innocence. So the, the force you're defending yourself against is an unlawful force, not a lawful force. 
So someone else is being the unlawful criminal initial aggressor in the confrontation, not you. If you're defending yourself against lawful force, like a, a police officer making a lawful arrest of you, using force to do that, he may be the first to use force, but his force is his force is lawful, so he's not triggering your self-defense privilege. Uh, continuing. Um, oh, and here, they're using the word necessary here. This is really a reference to imminence, the element of imminence. Imminence means that the unlawful force you're defending against is either actually occurring or immediately about to occur. That's what makes the defensive force necessary. So it's not a past threat that's already over. Someone punched you yesterday. You can't use defensive force against them today because of yesterday's punch. It can't be a future speculative threat that may never happen. Someone says, I'm going to go home and come back here with a gun and shoot you. Well, when he comes back with a gun, he's an eminent deadly force threat. But just the statement that he intends to do that at some point in the future, that in that moment, it's not an eminent threat. Indiana's referencing that element by using the term necessary here because of the threats over in the past, it's not necessary to defend against it. If the threat's speculative in the, in the future may never happen, it's not in the moment necessary to defend against it. Uh, and then it continues, no person, employer, or a state of a person in the state shall be placed in legal jeopardy of any kind for protecting themselves or a third person by reasonable means necessary. Um, this is kind of circular reasoning. It's saying uh, they we just define self-defense, and if your use of force was lawful self-defense, you shouldn't face legal jeopardy. But how do you decide if it was legal self-defense, right? The process of inquiring whether or not your conduct falls within the legal boundaries, uh, that's inherently legal jeopardy, right? It's a, it's a trial. Um, so it's kind of circular. Paragraph D. Um, a person is justified in using reasonable force, including deadly force, against another person and does not have a duty to retreat if the person reasonably believes that the force is necessary to prevent or terminate the other's unlawful entry or attack on the person's dwelling, curtilage, or occupied motor vehicle. So this is the defense of highly defensible property provision. And how's it defining highly defensible property? Dwelling? Curtilage, curtilage is the area around your home, immediately around your home. That's part of the normal day-to-day -day function of your home. So it's extending the scope of highly defensible property outside the four walls of your home to like your front porch, your back porch, your front yard, your backyard. Uh, if you live on 50 acres, the 50th acre is probably not going to be curtilage. It, it becomes, there's no bright line that limits or defines the scope of the curtilage. It's it's done on a case-by-case -case basis. It's, so you never really know if you're standing in your curtilage or not, uh, for the most part. Um, some states will say it includes your front porch, your back porch, and the area around your home that's part of the day-to-day -day use of your home. So sometimes it provides some objective criteria, but ultimately the far boundary of your curtilage is, is generally not sharply defined. Uh, except that once you reach a point from your home where you no longer have the right of exclusion, so it's a like a public street, your curtilage is definitely done then because other people have a right to be there. So your dwelling, the curtilage around your dwelling, or an occupied motor vehicle. So an unoccupied motor vehicle is personal property. And in 49 states, including Indiana, you can only use non-deadly force at most in defense of personal property items like a cell phone or a purse or an unoccupied vehicle. But if the vehicle's occupied, suddenly it becomes highly defensible property. Why? Because really the, the real definition of highly defensible property is it's property that serves as a core function, the shelter and protection of people. And if there's people inside the vehicle, that's what the vehicle's doing. Uh, so dwelling curtilage and occupied motor vehicle is the scope of highly defensible property under Indiana law. And it provides that you can use deadly force to prevent or terminate some other's unlawful entry or attack on that highly defensible property. Now, attack suggests forcible, right? Uh, certainly, I don't, someone's going to, th you know, they have a lit Molotov cocktail in their hand. They're going to throw it through the window of your home. I would consider that an imminent attack on the dwelling. 
but it also says, or unlawful entry. Most states that have these provisions that allow you to use deadly force in the context of highly defensible property require both unlawful entry, so someone's not there by license, they're there without permission, they're trespassing, and a forcible entry. So they broke something to get in. They usually require both unlawful and forcible entry. Why do they do that? Because they're concerned about the innocent intruder, someone who's present unlawfully, but without malice. They're there unlawfully by accident. They mistakenly think they have permission. They were a repairman sent to the wrong address. Or they're an out-of-town visitor that walks into the wrong apartment in the apartment block. And the law often doesn't want to create these special provisions for the use of deadly force against the innocent intruder. But Indiana doesn't require both, either unlawful entry or an attack on the dwelling, curtilage, occupied vehicle is sufficient to trigger this privilege to use deadly force in defense of highly defensible property. So a broader privilege than the states that require both unlawful entry and forcible entry. Uh, then we continue. E, with respect to property other than a dwelling, curtilage, or an occupied motor vehicle. So property that does not fall within Indiana's definition of highly defensible property. A person is justified in using reasonable force against another if they reasonably believe that the force is necessary to immediately, that goes to eminence, prevent or terminate the other's trespass on or criminal interference with property lawfully in the person's possession, lawfully in possession of a member of the person's immediate family, or belonging to a person whose property the person has authority to protect. However, so now we're talking about personal property, right? Not highly defensible property. However, a person is justified in using deadly force and does not have a duty to retreat only if that force is justified under subsection C. What is subsection C? That's the straight up self-defense statute that we covered earlier. So you're not allowed to use deadly force in defense of mere personal property in the absence of a deadly force threat to persons or forcible felony, right? The provisions covered in paragraph C. And by the way, you don't even have black blanket license to use even just non-deadly force in defense of any personal property. It's only specific categories of personal property. So it has to be personal property in your possession, in the possession of immediate family, and what's the definition of immediate family? Is your second cousin twice removed immediate family? And now in many states will somewhere have a definition of immediate family. I'm not going to look it up here. I know in Ohio, the definition of immediate family is rather odd. It includes some things we would commonly think of as immediate family members and excludes others. And if you don't know what the definition is, well, then you don't know if you have the legal privilege to even use non-deadly force. or belonging to a person whose property the person has authority to protect. So you're, you're a loss prevention agent in a store, for example. Uh, you're a security guard, something along those lines. But that lady who's, you don't know, a stranger, suddenly shouts out, oh my God, that guy stole my purse. Stop him, stop him. Is that woman, is the property that's being taken, is it in your possession? No. Is it in the possession of your immediate family member? No. Do you have a legal duty or obligation to protect that stranger's property? No. So how much privilege do you have to stop that thief in defense of her property, to use force on the thief, even non-deadly force, to prevent the theft of that property? I don't see any privilege. So be aware of those limitations, folks. Also, notice that it doesn't say anything here about recovery of property. So it's to immediately prevent or terminate someone's trespass or criminal interference, theft of property in your possession or a family member or someone, someone whose property you have a duty to protect. What if you have, a, you have a unique jacket? It was bought for you as a gift. It has your name embroidered on it. There's not another jacket in the world that looks quite like that. Instantly identifiable as your personal property. And you're at a restaurant, you're at one of these restaurants that has kind of a general coat rack and you hang your coat there, you eat your meal. When you go to leave, your jacket's gone. Someone stole it. And two days later, you see a dude walking down the street wearing your jacket. 
how much force can you use against that person to recover your property? None. You're supposed to call the police. Because to recover your property, you would not be engaged in the immediate prevention or termination of the theft of the property. Uh, continuing now with chapter F, chapter F, paragraph F, a, a person is justified in, oh, this is an interesting provision. This is the uh, aircraft hijacking provision. Um, it's probably like from the 1970s when aircraft hijackings were more common, but they put a lot of effort into this. A person is justified in using reasonable force, including deadly force against any other person and does not have a duty to retreat if they reasonably believe the force is necessary to prevent or stop the other person from hijacking, attempting to hijack or otherwise seizing or attempting to seize unlawful control of an aircraft in flight. Seems reasonable enough, especially after 9-11. Um, then they give a very broad definition of what's considered to be an aircraft in flight. It doesn't actually have to be in flight. Uh, for purposes of this subsection, an aircraft is considered to be in flight while the aircraft is on the ground. So explicitly not in flight. After the doors are closed for takeoff and until the aircraft takes off, or if it's in the airspace above Indiana, fair enough, that's in flight, or on the ground in Indiana before the doors have been opened after landing. It's almost like the definition of operating a vehicle for DWI, right? We, of course, driving, actually driving down the road would be covered under operating a vehicle for DUI purposes. Um, but it tends to be defined much more broadly than that. So just operating any facet of the vehicle, uh, you got the key turned to auxiliary. So you're, you're, uh, the radio's playing or it's cold out. So you, you run the engine. So you have heat in the car. You don't think of it as drunk driving, but you are operating the vehicle, you'll get a DWI if you're, if you're drunk, of course. Uh, let's see, notwithstanding subsection C through E. So C was straight up self-defense, traditional five elements of self-defense, self-defense law. Uh, D was defense of highly defensible property. E was defense of personal property. Uh, notwithstanding subsection C through E, a person is not justified in using force if, and now we have a bunch of exclusions. And these exclusions generally will go to the question of innocence, whether you were the unlawful aggressor uh, or a mutual combatant or provoker with intent. So these read, uh, you're not justified in using force, even if you meet all the other conditions. You're still not justified in using defensive force if uh, you're committing or escaping after the commission of a crime. All right, fair enough. Um Although it matters how broadly this is defined, right? So I don't, I don't know what the drug laws are in Indiana, but let's, let's imagine that you know, marijuana is illegal and you're in possession of marijuana illegally. Are you committing a crime by being unlawfully in possession of marijuana? Sure. Does that mean if you were attacked, you wouldn't have a pri privilege of self-defense because you're not justified in using defensive force if you're committing a crime? I mean, I would argue that the crime in question has to have some uh, proximal connection to the need to use defensive force. So if your crime is you're robbing a liquor store and that's and you're threatened by the clerk who's acting in self-defense and that's why you use force against the clerk, I think that would clearly lose you the element of innocence as an unlawful aggressor in that confrontation. Uh, but what if you're doing something that's relatively innocuous compared to the need to use force? Like some modest drug possession. Um, the person, another exclusion, the person provokes unlawful action by another person with intent to cause bodily injury to the other person. I'm going to come back to this because I want to deal with three here first. The person has entered into combat with another or is the initial aggressor. So if you're the initial, and they mean initial physical aggressor here, if you're the first to threaten or use force, you lose the element of innocence. Uh, Self-defense is intended to privilege people to defend themselves from someone else's unlawful aggression. If you're the unlawful aggressor, you can't justify your unlawful aggressor action as lawful self-defense, right? What, what could be more obvious than that? And when you enter into combat, they're talking about mutual combat or combat by agreement. That's when usually it's two guys. That's when two guys say, let's go outside and settle this like men. 
like idiots. Uh, and in the eyes of the law, then they're each acting as a initial aggressor. They're mutual initial aggressors. So they, they both lose the element of innocence. They both lose self-defense. Now, if you're simply the initial aggressor, you don't necessarily lose self-defense permanently. There are ways to regain your status as the innocent party. And the statute refers to this. So you are uh, not justified in using force if you are the a mutual combatant or an initial aggressor, unless you withdraw from the encounter and communicate to the other person your intent to withdraw from the encounter. And now what has to happen for the fight to continue? If you're withdrawing, hey, I don't want to fight, man. I don't want to fight anymore. Uh, and the now for the fight to continue, the other person has to come to you, right? So it addresses that. And the other person nevertheless continues or threatens to continue unlawful action. So if you withdraw from the fight, even if you started it, so you were the initial aggressor, you shoved that guy, you, you threw the first punch, not in self-defense. If you withdraw from the fight, communicate your withdrawal, and the other person pursues, in the eyes of the law, a second fight has started where the other party is now the initial aggressor, and you've recovered innocence. Now, your recovery of innocence does not work retroactively. If you were the initial aggressor because you shoved that guy, that's a, a simple battery, you're on the hook for that simple battery. That doesn't go away. But when you withdraw and communicate your withdrawal, you regain innocence, you regain self-defense moving forward from the moment of your withdrawal and your communication. So you might have been the initial unlawful aggressor and you can still regain innocence moving forward by withdrawal and communication. But there's a particular kind of initial aggressor that cannot regain innocence by withdrawal and communication. And that is the paragraph B. The person who provokes unlawful action by another with the intent to cause bodily injury to the other person, a provoker with intent. So when you're the provoker, you're not the initial aggressor, right? When you're the provoker, you're provoking the other person to be the initial aggressor, maybe with insults, whatever the case might be. Uh, go ahead, throw the first punch, I dare you. And if you're doing that, so you'll have an excuse to use force against them. You're doing that. You're provoking them with the intent to then cause them bodily injury as a result of them having been provoked. That's a provoker with intent. You lose the justification of self-defense because you lose innocence and there is no way to recover it. Because note, in paragraph three, the simple aggressor, it talks about withdraw from the encounter and communicate. No such language. In paragraph two, talking about the provoker with intent. So if you're the provoker with intent, you own that fight, period. Uh, let's see, uh, notwithstanding subsection F, let's see, what was F? F was the hijacking scenario. I'm gonna skip over that in the interest of time. By the way, the links to this statute and the self-defense immunity statute will be in the description on the law self-defense blog post, the, the playback version of today's show for, for you law assault defense members. Uh, then they have this provision about a person is justified in using reasonable force against a public servant. And most states don't have this explicit provision, although they generally have similar law. So you can use force against a public servant like a police officer. If you reasonably believe that force is necessary to protect you or a third person from unlawful force, so, for example, the officer is using excessive force or to prevent or terminate that public servant's unlawful entry or attack on dwelling curtilage occupied motor vehicle or to prevent or terminate the public servant's unlawful trespass or criminal interference with personal property in your possession, family member possession, uh, property that you have a legal duty to protect. Note, however, that all of these are contingent on the public servant acting unlawfully. There are a lot of circumstances in which police can initiate force, can enter a property, can interfere with personal property, and be doing it lawfully. And if they're doing it lawfully, you don't have this privilege to use force to stop them. Uh, and then they have a bunch of exclusions uh, about um, when you can use force against a public servant. and more, more conditions about that public servant use. So there's always a tension there, right? We don't want public servants, even law enforcement officers, to be able to use force unlawfully against the citizens. 
So we want to balance that. There are limitations on when and how police officers can use force on you. But we also want officers to be able to do their jobs, right? When they're when they're dealing with unlawful actors. Okay, so that's the self-defense statute. And at the very beginning, in that first paragraph, it references provisions concerning civil immunity in this second statute. So I'm going to open up that second statute. And it's 3430-31-1, justified use of force, has some definitions of forcible felony. Any offense described in this other statute, uh, meaning a felony that involves the use or threat of force against a human... Sorry. Let me, let me start this again. So here's the immunity statute, 3430-31-1. Has some definitions of forcible felony. Any offense described here, forcible felony means a felony that involves the use or threat of force against a human being or in which there is an imminent danger of bodily injury. So I mentioned earlier, write a bad check over a certain dollar amount could well be a felony, but it wouldn't be a forcible felony. Or a residential entry. So this would be you know, an unlawful intrusion. A person who knowingly or intentionally breaks and enters the dwelling of another. So breaking. Um, we'd have to look at the, at the case law on this. So breaking and entering tends to be a legal term of art. Uh, when we're talking about breaking and entering as an independent crime, uh, it's usually not required that literally something be broken to get in. What they're referring to there is breaking the plane of the home. So the front door could be wide open. Them stepping through the doorway is breaking for breaking and entering purposes. Um, and of course, we saw that Indiana doesn't require both unlawful presence and forcible entry for its defense of highly defensible property provision. But states that do require both unlawful entry and forcible entry, typically they do require that something was broken. So merely stepping through an open doorway wouldn't be sufficient because that could still be an innocent intruder. So you have to look at the, the public policy rationales for these things as well. So that's the breaking and entering provision there. Or burglary. See how complicated the definition of burglary Indiana has. Well, lots of levels. Starts at a level five felony. So it's always a felony. And then it goes up to level four, level three, level two, level one. These are all increasing levels of severity and punishment with the highest level being into a dwelling that results in serious bodily injury to someone within uh, the dwelling. But all of these involve uh, breaks and enters the building or structure of another person. Okay, so various definitions of forcible entry. Uh, the justified use of force described in the statute we were just looking at, Indiana self-defense statute, provides a complete immunity against any claim or action initiated by a person who alleges to have been injured or damaged by such defensive force and whose conduct justified the use of force. So this is interesting because it doesn't apply to just anybody. Uh, someone makes a claim against you that we're talking a civil claim, not a prosecution. So this is referring to civil immunity only. And it applies only when someone claims uh, I was injured or damaged. And that could mean family, like a wrongful death suit of, by a surviving family. They suffered injury or damage because of the wrongful death. Uh, I would expect it would be expansive to that group as well, not just the, the single person who was actually physically injured. Uh, but the person who was physically injured or damaged, uh, you have immunity against them, but they also have had to been the person that justified your use of force. So the aggressor that you defended yourself against, but this would not apply to like an innocent bystander. Right. So if you shoot at someone who's actually trying to kill you and your bullet hits them and then it over penetrates and it goes on to hit an innocent bystander, you would not have immunity against that innocent bystander. There would be legal arguments you could make why you should not have civil liability with regards to that bystander transferred intent for the most part. Uh, but this immunity provision would not apply because the innocent bystander was not the person engaged in the conduct that justified your use of defensive force. 
Uh, then it continues, in no case shall any force justified under the self-defense statute we just looked at give rise to any claim or action for damages or compensation against a person, employer, estate, uh, on behalf of any person who brought the lawsuit, the plaintiff, who was committing or attempting to commit a forcible felony. So they lose their right to sue you or was attempting to cause or causing unlawful serious bodily injury. So they were attempting to kill or maim you. Uh, and that applies both to the person who was trying to kill or maim you and their estate. So if you kill them in self-defense, they're a surviving family. They don't have a cause of action against you. They don't have a civil claim against you for your use of defensive force if these conditions are met. Uh, if a defendant files a motion for, I believe it's, this is a motion for summary judgment. So you, it's a motion you can file before the trial even starts. Your Honor, even if every claim the plaintiff is making is true, they still would not be entitled to compensation. Um, and if that's the case, if the judge agrees, then there's no point going to trial. You just dismiss the suit entirely. If a defendant files a motion for summary judgment and supports that motion with admissible evidence that establishes a prima facie, a more than 0% basis for the immunity we just discussed, the burden shall shift to the plaintiff to oppose the motion with their own admissible evidence, contradicting the claim of immunity uh, in order to establish a genuine issue of material fact for trial. Really makes sense. You're making an immunity claim. The burden's now on them, the plaintiff, to disprove your claim of immunity. Fair enough. The plaintiff should always have the burdens. Uh, but sometimes... Sometimes the burden for various defenses is put on the defense. They're just making clear here the burden on the immunity claim. And again, we're just in civil court here. It's not criminal immunity. The burden on the immunity claim is on the plaintiff. Now, here's the facet that uh, I found hard to believe when Sir Brass brought it to my attention, but is really interesting. And he was quite correct uh, in a civil case. So we're not talking, again, criminal immunity. This is not immunity from criminal prosecution, just civil but we're going to bring the prosecutor into it in, from a, a flanking position in a civil case. So you're being sued because you harmed somebody with force. So you're being civilly sued for the damage, the harm you caused, and you're claiming immunity because you're claiming that your conduct fits within the legal definition of self-defense. In a civil case in which an immunity defense is raised, the fact that a defendant was not prosecuted for a crime related to that use of force creates a rebuttable presumption that the defendant's use of force was justified. And the jury shall be instructed on this presumption if the case goes to trial. That is unusual. We're saying that a, a decision or the lack of a decision by a prosecutor to bring a criminal charge changes the civil landscape. Now, that's, it's not obvious that that should be the case. Prosecutors don't bring charges for all kinds of reasons. One big reason might be, hey, I've got to disprove this guy's claim of self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt at trial. I think it's 75%, 80% likely that it wasn't self-defense, but that's not enough to get a, a criminal conviction, so I'm not going to bring him to criminal trial. In civil court, all that's required for the plaintiff to win is 51% that it was not self-defense. So if there's 75, 80% evidence against self-defense, that's not enough for a criminal conviction, but it's more than enough to win in civil court. So there's, there's perfectly reasonable scenarios in which a prosecutor would decline to criminally charge, but it's still a viable case in civil court. Just look at the OJ Simpson trial, right? Acquitted in criminal trial, found civilly liable in civil court when he was sued. But what this is saying is, should the prosecutor decide not to prosecute, not to criminally charge, and he, he doesn't even have to make an affirmative decision, if it just doesn't happen, the fact that you were not criminally charged now carries over to civil court to create a rebuttable presumption that your force was lawful self-defense, and the jury, if it goes to trial, is to be explicitly told that. Pretty good stuff. Uh, and if you're doing it in summary judgment, so before there is a jury pre-trial, you're, you're arguing to the judge, even if everything the plaintiff says is true, they're still not entitled to um, damages. Um, if you're arguing in summary judgment, uh, the fact that the defendant was not prosecuted for a crime related to their use of force shall also create 
a prima facie basis for the application of that immunity. And finally, we get the reimbursement language, uh, which is common to many self-defense immunity statutes. In any action, and they have a date here after June 30th, uh, 2019, in which the defense meets these conditions for criteria, they're sued anyway. At the conclusion of the suit, uh, they win. Uh, the they win the action. The court shall, shall award to the defendants um, any reasonable attorney's fees and cost incurred in defending the action if a defendant successfully moves for summary judgment, judgment on the basis of immunity. And the important word here, folks, is shall award. So if a defendant moves for summary judgment and it's granted on the basis of immunity, the court is obliged to award you, the defendant, in the action, reasonable attorney's fees and costs occurred in defending the action. Sometimes these statutes say may award. And if it's left to the discretion of the trial court, they generally don't award those fees and costs. Because in civil court, basically everyone pays their own fees and costs. That's the norm. So if you leave it to the discretion of the court, they, they revert to the norm. Everyone pays their own legal expenses. You don't get compensated for anything. But here they're saying you shall award the attorney's fees and the costs incurred if you win on the basis of immunity. But the, the, the most in, that's pretty common. The really interesting facet here was the bringing in of the prosecutor's decision uh, not to simply if a defendant was not prosecuted. It creates a rebuttable presumption in civil court, which the prosecutor has nothing to do with. It creates a rebuttable presumption in civil court that the use of force by the defendant was lawful under Indiana's self-defense law. All right, so that is what I wanted to cover today. Let's take a look now at the member chat and address questions and comments that have come in. Whoops. All right. Yes, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Sir Brass. Thank you very much for bringing that Indiana immunity provision to my attention. Um, yeah, again, we don't have much case law. We don't have any case law um, that I can find on, on quick review. I mean, this is the... Uh, this is the... Let me, let me share the uh, the image here. I don't want that. I want this. So this is the uh, the in my office our professional legal database that we use is Lexis. So this is my Lexis account. Um, we we pay thousands of dollars a year this access folks um uh indiana code uh 34 31-1 justified use of force this is the immunity statute we just read you can see all the language we just looked at and then what lexus does is it helpfully annotates at the bottom of the statute or provides lots of case law references how the courts have interpreted and applied the statute very useful for legal research purposes the history Effective April 26, 2019, so a relatively new statute. And as you can see, that's the bottom of the page. Zero case law annotated by Lexis, and they're pretty good about this kind of stuff, um, on that statute. So we just don't know. We don't know. There's a certain level of ambiguity until that's clarified. Um, let's see. Ba, 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 ba. Yeah, and so Indiana, again, it's addressing only civil immunity. There's no, that I'm aware of, criminal immunity provision under Indiana law. Florida, in contrast, has provisions for both criminal immunity, so it stops the prosecution, and civil immunity. Uh, and they're actually, that not only does Florida's civil immunity provision uh, provide for um, compensation to the defendant if they're successful um it actually also strips the plaintiff say the plaintiff is a 
a criminal in jail, right? They had, they tried to rob you. You shot them in self-defense. Now they're sitting in jail on the robbery charge. They lose uh, their, their prison privileges. So exercise yard, commissary, all that. They lose all that if they lose in their civil suit. So it has a, a, a very productive chilling effect on the plaintiff. I, the plaintiff is just doing this as, you know, to be a nu nuisance, basically suing you. Uh, let's see. Yeah, some references to the Alec Murdoch stuff. I, you know, it's not a self-defense trial, so I probably won't cover it much here at Law Self-Defense. I, I, I did follow the entire trial. I watched every minute of it. Uh, and I do often comment on the trial on other people's YouTube shows. I was on a couple of shows yesterday talking about it. Uh, what's being alleged is that the court clerk in the Alec Murdoch, Alec Murdoch, the South Carolina lawyer who was um, uh, criminally prosecuted for the on charges of murdering his wife and son. Uh, now, let there be no question, Alec Murdoch's an unbelievable scumbag. He stole tons of money from lots of people, his law partners, family, friends, clients, crippled clients who desperately needed that money. He was a drug addict, just a, a scum of a human being. But that's a different legal question than whether or not he murdered his wife and son. Um, and personally, I, I found more, more than enough to constitute reasonable doubt on those criminal charges. I thought there was a lot of poor evidentiary decisions by the judge in that case, Judge Newman. And now we have affidavits from some of the jurors that the court clerk engaged in jury tampering and evidence fabrication in the case. Um, and, and under South Carolina law, if, if that occurred, if that's believed to be true, and there's going to be an evidentiary hearing now, I expect, to determine whether or not that appears to be true. But under South Carolina law, if the court clerk engaged in jury tampering, we don't even have to ask whether or not it seems to have improperly influenced a jury. It's just a new trial, period. That That's how corrupting that kind of conduct is. Uh, now, I don't, I don't know if she did that or not, but we have sworn affidavits from several jurors that she did. Um, and if she did, th those are felonies. So the, the court clerk should be prosecuted. Uh, the danger here, of course, is that, well, who would prosecute her? Because the law enforcement locally can't be trusted. The, the, the chief investigator against Alec Murda testified on the witness stand at the trial that, that he perjured himself to the grand jury and fabricated evidence to get the indictment against Alec Murda in the first place on the murder charge. So can you trust SLED? By the way, that chief investigator was just made SLED Officer of the Year, despite confessing to perjuring and fabricating evidence to the grand jury. So you can't trust SLEDs, and SLEDs the highest level law enforcement office in the state of South Carolina. So who do you go to then? The FBI? You trust the FBI these days? So it's all a little awkward. Uh, let's see. You know, curtilage uh, in the context of highly defensible property, we, we run into a conflict when the highly defensible property statute says things like to terminate an entry, uh, and then that refers to curtilage um, because it, it becomes ambiguous. What's the entry then? So imagine, for example, that you have a, a, you know five acres of front yard. At some point, someone approaching your home is in the curtilage. But are, are they in the curtilage the, the first foot they step onto your property five acres away? Uh, maybe. I mean, you could make that argument, but most states would say no. Because that far out, it's not part of the normal day-to-day -day use of your home. So it doesn't fall within the definition of curtilage. The closer they get to your home, the more likely it is that they are within your curtilage. So is it entry into the curtilage? Or would it be required that we're talking entry inside the four walls of the house? And the trouble is you don't know. You don't know how curtilage will be scoped because it's not, you don't decide what the curtilage is, right? Other people do. The judge does. The jury does. And they do it after the fact, after you've already shot that guy. So at the moment you shot him, do you know whether or not you're standing in your curtilage or whether entry into your curtilage is enough? I, I don't see how you could. So, you, you know, you're increasing your risk. I would I would much prefer not to be taking advantage of these highly defensible property statutes for my curtilage. 
I would prefer to be inside my home defending from inside my home. And if they're coming in, reasonably appear to be eminently coming in, uh, they're trying hard to break down the door. Uh, they're going to be throwing Molotov cocktails through the window of my house. I can see them prepping the, the Molotov cocktails. That That's imminent entry into the home. Uh, let's see. Yeah, and the same with references to immediate family. So there are some states when we talk about defense of personal property, right? You can defend against the immediate taking of your own personal property in your possession or property in the possession of immediate family. And there are some states that provide a, an explicit definition of what qualifies as immediate family. Ohio is one of those. Uh, but other states might not. And then it becomes ambiguous in the same way that curtilage becomes ambiguous. Uh, let's see. Uh, Gary asks, uh, a woman sitting in her car in a parking lot, car doors are locked. Another person comes up to the car and using force to try to break into the car. The woman in the car rolled down the car window and used pepper spray to stop this unlawful entry. Um, is deadly force justified against whom? I mean, the car, if, if we're, I don't have time to go look up, you know, I mean, here, an occupied vehicle under Indiana law is highly defensible property. A forcible entry into the un highly defensible property, the occupied car, would trigger the privilege to use deadly defensive force by the occupant of the car, the woman here. So, yes. Let's see. Uh, Gary asks, can deadly force be used to shoot through a window home when an unlawful intruder is trying to break in? Uh, well, what's the evidence that he's trying to break in? Again, when we get into ambiguity, the people deciding the facts are not you. Your interpretation of the facts is not what controls your legal outcome. It's the decisions of the judge, of the jury, of the prosecution. So the more ambiguous it is, whether or not there was an attempted entry, were they just knocking on the door? Were they pounding on the door? Were they kicking the door? Is the door frame cracking? That's not ambiguous anymore. But there's a big continuum of what qualifies as unlawful entry. We have the case of the uh, the old man, Andrew Lester, right? Who, who shot through his door, uh, the young black man outside his door. He says that guy was trying to make an unlawful entry into my home. Maybe. But where's the objective evidence of that? The door is, you know, the, the storm door is not ripped off the hinges. So that's, that's the risk when the facts become ambiguous. If it's unambiguous that someone's trying to make an unlawful entry, well, under Indiana law, that would be sufficient to trigger the privilege, unlawful entry into highly defensible property to uh, trigger the privilege for deadly defensive force. Yeah, so this whole can you use force against a public servant tends to come up in the uh, no-knock warrant scenario. So the cops get a warrant. Typically, these are drug warrants. Uh, they don't want to have to knock because if they knock and announce police, the drugs get flushed down the toilet. Um, just one of, the, one of the many negative consequences of the war on drugs. Not that there aren't positive consequences, uh, but... Uh, so we came up with these, this idea of no-knock warrants. The cops just kicked the door in well, use a battering ram, typically, um, and rush into the house. But sometimes they rush into the wrong house. So it's not the home of drug dealers. It's just normal people. And what do they see but a bunch of people, you know, battering down their front door and rushing in, screaming, lights in their face. Might that homeowner think it's a home invasion and draw his pistol from his holster and start shooting at the police officers, not knowing they're police officers or having reason to believe they may be fake police officers? Sure. And should that be a privileged use of deadly defensive force? Generally speaking, the answer is yes. So, but again, that's where, you know, the cops don't want that to be the rule, right? The cops want to be able to kick in a door and go in and, and you have no privilege to use force against them because they're cops. I think we need a smarter balance than that. And I think uh, generally we ought not be using no-knock warrants except in the most unusual of cases. Um, I'm not in favor of them for drug cases, which is the most common application. But imagine, for example, a kidnapping or hostage type situation. Uh, you may want to be able to go in real quick without knocking, right? Let's see.
Pa, 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 pa. All right. I think that is everything. And it's time for me to go to jujitsu. So. Yep, I think that's everything. All right, folks. So thank you so much for joining me here again today. Um, I really, really appreciate it. Especially all you law self-defense members, you make all of this possible. So until next time, I'll remind all of you that if you carry a gun, so you're hard to kill, carry a knife, carry pepper spray, study jujitsu. Like I do, I do all those things. So I'm hard to kill. So my family is hard to kill. Then you also owe it to yourself and your family to make sure you know the law so you're hard to convict as well. Until next time, I remain attorney Andrew Branker for Law Self-Defense. Stay safe.